right, it's a day of reckoning. I gave you a memory verse last week. You remember what it was? Just give me the reference first. Romans 1, 16. Uh, I gave it to you on the Facebook page in the ESV and also the NIV. I'm not saying you need to learn it from either one of those. I want you to learn it, matter of fact, from the translation that you use uh, out of your Bible. Uh, and so... Here it goes. We're going to say it together. Are you ready? You can say it, say it in your translation. That's fine. Uh, I'm not going to say it very loud because I don't want everybody just to follow me and kind of mumble along with me. Uh, are you ready? All right. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Okay. Okay. It was a lot, but it, it worked. Y'all did good. All right. Very good. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to all those who believe, the Jew first, and also the Greek. Very good. I'm proud of you. That went well. Now, we're going to do this every week. So I've got another one for you. And from now on, they're all going to have, they have a theme for several months to come. It's all one theme. I'll see if you can, can pick up on it. But next week's verse... Uh, our scripture is Exodus 34 and verse 6. I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to have it up there. It says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. This is when Moses asked God uh, if he could see him. And so he passes before him and he says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So that is your assignment for next week. And uh, sometime this afternoon, I will put up uh, helps. Did they help what I put up last week? Okay, good. I want to make sure they're being used. Uh, if not, then I'll, you know, we won't use those. But if you're using them, I will continue to put those up. So I'll do that this afternoon. Open your Bible to the book of Galatians. And we continue this morning. Actually, we'll finish this morning looking at our theme for this month. Of from slave to slave experiencing freedom in Jesus. Because in, before Christ, we are a slave to sin. But the Bible makes it very clear that in Christ, we become a slave of righteousness, a bondservant of God. We have been rescued. The Bible makes that very clear, that we have been rescued through Jesus. Romans 6 and verse 18 says, Having been set free from sin, we have become slaves of righteousness that's good news Paul writes for us in the book of Galatians chapter 5 in verse 1 he says for freedom Christ has set us free or you free stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery the idea is as if you were listening in the scripture reading that you're in Jesus now, he's telling this group of Christians that are in Galatia. He said, you're in Jesus now, but if you go back to that yoke of slavery, you become bondage to that. You are a slave to that again. And he makes it very clear in the book of Galatians that that is not the way you find freedom. Freedom is found only, only in Jesus. Not a combination of the two, not just the law, but only in Christ. We are granted freedom in Jesus. And as um, Tyler prayed a minute ago, I, I love that prayer. Uh, I love it when I hear uh, y'all pray for things that we've said in, in the lesson. That we are set free, <clears throat> but that freedom is not the freedom to do what we want. It's not the freedom to behave how we want. It's not the freedom to be selfish as, as much as we want and do what we want with with whoever we want and however we want without any kind of repercussion. Matter of fact, Paul anticipates that. And he says in, in, in uh, Romans 6 in, in verse 1, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, can we continue to live this way because we can be forgiven? We're free. And he says, God forbid. How, how shall we who have died to sin continue to live in it? He says it's impossible. That's not the way Christians live. So how does freedom... The freedom that we have in Jesus, how does it impact our day-to-day -day life? Tomorrow morning when you wake up, snow maybe, can we, 
but we'll see. Uh, it's supposed to, yeah, it's supposed to snow tonight, absolutely. Uh, so when you wake up in the morning, Monday morning, what are the implications of freedom in Jesus? What does that look like? What is it going to look like Tuesday in the office or Wednesday in line at Walmart or whatever the case may be? What, is, what does that look like? I, I honestly uh, wish I had a better understanding of it than what I do. I wish sometimes that I could sit down and pick Paul's brain, don't you? Don't you wish you could ask him some questions or things that he writes? What do you, what do you mean by this exactly? You know, tell me a little bit more about this. I wish he was here this morning. I could just hand it over to him and, and take his seat. And Paul could expound on this concept of freedom in Jesus. Because I guarantee you he can make it a whole lot more clear uh, than I could. Uh, but that's not that you're stuck with me this morning. Uh, so I hope as we wrap this study up of Christian freedom uh, that today's lesson is coherent. Uh, and it leads us uh, together in a better understanding of what it means to be free in Jesus. The Christians in the province of Galatia, who this letter is written and, and sent to, and, and it circulated, we're looking at a big uh, area here when we're talking about Galatia. We're not talking about a city. We're talking about a, a big piece of land, multiple cities. So there were multiple churches. So this letter was, was sent. It would have been uh, received by one church and read there. Perhaps they would have even uh, copied it down to continue to have a copy of that, and then they would have sent it to another church, same thing, and it would have gone around in the area. Uh, but they, you, we find out in chapter 1 that Paul tells them, he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the good news and you are uh, uh, turning to a different gospel, which he says really isn't good news at all. It, it may seem like it's good news. It may be... Uh, presented to you as something better than the good news of Jesus. Uh, but he says, really, if you want to know the honest truth, it's terrible news. It's not good news at all. Matter of fact, it's condemning news. And so we understand that some false brothers, uh, they'd slipped in to spy out the freedom in Jesus that was being proclaimed. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 4 we see that. And these false teachers, they were instructing the Galatians something along these lines. It says, you have been circumcised, uh, that is, uh, uh, or that you have to be circumcised, that is, to, to follow the law of Moses in order to follow Jesus. So they're trying to combine and add to Jesus. Now, I, I don't want to presume that I knew why they're saying this, or, or what's the reason that they are trying to do this. You may, we might could draw some conclusions. But anyways, they were trying to say it's Jesus plus the law. It's Jesus plus circumcision is what saves. And as I think about this, it's easy for me to sit here and go, how foolish they are to believe such a thing. The Bible makes it very clear that you can't, obey the old law and the new law together and expect that to save you. It is it's the new law in Jesus. I understand that and I get that. But I've got to do my best to sympathize with them. Think about living under the old law and this traveling preacher comes in and instead of preaching the old law and what I need to do, he opens up the old law and says, here's the Messiah that it's been talking about, and here's what he's brought. And here's how everything has changed. And here's how all this old stuff now that it's been talking about is now put away, and now we're under a new covenant, a better covenant, sealed by the blood of Jesus, not by the blood of bulls and goats. And I have to imagine, that was difficult. That was difficult. They were entrenched in that. It would be like somebody coming in here this morning or, or next Sunday and going, you know what, everything that you've been taught all your life and all the traditions that you hold to and everything, it's wrong. Now there's something better that's come. It would be like, say what? You can't be right. You, there's no way. That's exactly what these Christians are feeling. It would be very hard to turn from that and turn to Jesus. And so Paul preached to them the good news 
that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, so that we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one, no one will be justified. If you've ever read through the law, it doesn't take long to notice. There's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of thou shall and thou shall not and do this and don't do that. And if you're going to do this, you've got to do it this way and this way. And that, you know, There's a lot of particulars there in the law. There's a lot of stuff to follow. And so one uh, aspect of the law is, was that it pointed to the fact that they needed a Savior. Because they can't keep the law perfectly. And if you transgress the law, what are you? You're condemned. You're a sinner. And so they had all these sacrifices to take care of that. And, and, and all of them point to Jesus. But no one was good enough to keep the law perfectly. There no, therefore, no one could be declared by his or her own merit before God. And so Paul asked them in Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 through 5, he says, let me, he says, let me ask you a question. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? That is, of, of circumcision and, and doing things this way and that way and these sacrifices and, and all that kind of stuff. Or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, are, are you, do you think that you're capable of being spirit-empowered to do things, but now you want to rely on yourself to finish it? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Then verse 5, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? In other words, is God doing this because of your ability or is he working through your faith and believing? The Galatians started out by accepting the free gift of salvation, but it seems uh, they began to live their new life through a, a works-based system, somehow combining uh, the, the old law and the new law, and, and kind of counting on the fact that they were uh, had entered into a covenant relationship with God through the old law, but now a covenant relationship with God through Jesus, and now they were kind of relying on, on both of those things. Paul said that was distorting the gospel in a way that isn't the gospel at all. You know, you can take something that's good and then start rewording it and making it into something else that's not good at all. And, and that's what, exactly what they were doing. Matter of fact, Paul says, it is enslaving you again. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law, circumcision is, is one of the big things that uh, he talks about here, are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. No one can keep the law with perfection. It's, it's impossible. And so they were under the curse of the law. And no one can, can be justified by the law, but through faith in Jesus, that is where they are justified. That's how God works to make them right. And then, us also. If you have your Bibles, look at, at Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to read verses 6 and 7. Talking about the new covenant, the Hebrew writer says, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. And that's the whole uh, concept of the book of Hebrews, that Jesus is better. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Then we kind of maybe flip the page and look at chapter 9, uh, verse 15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. It's a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. 
It's only through the new and better covenant in Jesus that we can be justified. That we can be made right. That our sins can be washed away. That there's no reason to worry because I can't keep the law perfectly. But Jesus did. And because of Him, we can stand righteous. Now, there are, whether we like to admit it or not, there's a lot of times we resemble the Galatians more than what we would like to admit. Or maybe even more than what we realize look at chapter 3 again verses 2 and 3 he's again he says let me ask you only this did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith are you so foolish having begun by the spirit are you now being perfected by the flesh in other words they had entered into a covenant with God through Jesus the new covenant they had been immersed into uh, Jesus. Their sins had been washed away. They had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were now living Spirit-empowered lives. But something happened, and these false teachers came in and said, Well, I know what Paul said, but that's not exactly accurate. You've got to keep the old law, too. And so they said, Okay, well, I don't know how it went down exactly. Uh, but... They start doing that. They, they combine the two. And so just like these Jews who were set free from the law by faith in Jesus and were going back to the law, there are a lot of Christians, maybe you're one of them, who have put their faith in Jesus, but guess who they rely on to be made right before God? Themselves. Now, they're not going to say they don't rely on, they're not going to exclude Jesus from the picture. The Galatians weren't excluding Jesus from the picture. But a lot of times we say, I believe in Jesus, I'm saved by Jesus, but I've got to work so hard because I've got to be right before God. And so we, we count on our works and the work of Jesus. Let me explain a little, maybe better. There's, there's two ways that I... I've noticed, at least, and, and some of it, I've noticed it because I'm guilty of it myself uh, from time to time, that we try to work our way into God's good graces, or that we try to justify ourselves by our own uh, merit before God, and we try and do our very best to present ourselves on our own accord to be approved by God. And, and the first one uh, is what I've called checklist Christianity. Uh, you, we probably don't even need to keep going. Uh, you understand what, what I'm saying. We like checklists. We love checklists. We like to see what we need to do. We like to see the progress that we're making. We like to see the idea of I'm almost done, almost at the end. I got one more thing to check off and my day is over. And so once we check that off, we feel so good about ourselves. And we should. That's good. You, you accomplished a lot. During the day, we, we can feel good because I did today what I needed to do. And now I don't have something hanging over my head on tomorrow that i got to add to the list. And so we, we like checklists because we can see we got the job done. We do that as Christians, right? We do that as Christians. Uh, some of you may leave here this morning and check off the box. I did it. I did it. I was, I was in Bible class. Oh, maybe I was in Bible class, but I was in worship. You know, I did it. I did it. And, and that box will get checked off again next week uh, when you show up. And so we check that box off. Or you may check off the box at the end of the day. You know, I don't use profane uh, uh, language. I, I, don't, I don't curse. I don't use profanity. Or you may say, you know, at the end of the day, checked it off. I, I prayed. I, I read my Bible. Did what I was supposed to do. I read my daily devotion today. I read the, the chapter from the 365 challenge that were given. I, I memorized. I worked on the memory verse for next week. Check it off. I, I got it done. You may say, you know what? I, I've been married uh, 50, 60 years, and I've been faithful to my spouse. You know, I, I check it off. I did it again today. Well, I, I was here, and not only did I attend worship, but I also put something in the collection plate, either on the way in or, or uh, the way out. I can check that off. I did what I was supposed to do. I'm kind to others. I'm gentle. 
Uh, you know, and we and the list can go on and on and on of the things that we can check off. And, and, and in doing so, we rely on what we do to be right and present ourselves approved to God. We justify ourselves because of our actions. I did this, and I didn't do this. I didn't, didn't do, you know, I didn't participate in, in uh, the sin uh, of, of whatever nature. Well, here's what happens with that. When there is a sin or temptation that presents itself, and we do give in to it, and, and we sin, and maybe we do it again the next day and the next day, or maybe it's just something that overwhelms us in, in the moment or for the week or for a season in life, and we fall into that, we can get it stuck in our heads that I'm not doing enough, or I'm not trying hard enough or there's something wrong with me that I'm not able to do this or overcome this or I can work harder I've got this under control I can do this ever had that mentality I have it happens still from from time to time but the problem is when we have the mentality of I can do this or I've got this under control we will never experience the freedom that God gives us in Jesus. Because we think it's on our shoulders to take care of it instead of casting our cares, our anxieties, and our sin and let Jesus taking care of it. I understand. I understand there's this thing called freedom, or excuse me, uh, obedience. And we'll address that in, in just a minute. But if I'm relying on what I'm doing rather than on what Jesus has done, I'm not living in and living out the freedom that God gives because I will never do enough. I will never get it right. I may on occasions, I may go a few days and get it right. But there's going to be a third day or a fourth day or a fifth day or multiple days where I just get it wrong and my, my, I just mess it up. It's going to happen. And then I'm going to look at myself and wonder, what's wrong with me? Look at, at um, Luke. Luke chapter 17. <clears throat> Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 7. Jesus says, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or, or keeping sheep say to him who he... <clears throat> Let me start over. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he has done what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. You see the, the there? I, I can never do enough. And if I get it all just right, I've only done what's expected of me. How can I go above and beyond what Jesus has done? I can't. Checklist Christianity. It's, it's no good. And it gives rise to the, the second one, which I, I've called comparison Christianity. You know exactly what I'm talking about with that too. You've done it. I'm done it. I'm, I'm guilty of it. We, we have to be very careful about this because this is a trap that is very, very easy to fall into and very difficult, I think, to get out of many times. Sometimes we develop the mentality that since we're checking off our list of good works, that we become the standard of righteousness. I become the standard of of faithfulness and if other Christians are not doing what I'm doing at least doing what I'm doing then they're not faithful or not as faithful and and they've got some work to do because at least everybody can do what I'm doing right they can at least work to to, to that standard I, I believe that's part of, of what Paul is talking about in Galatians chapter 5 and, and in verse 15 he says but if you devour and if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. 
You know how consumed I can be and how biting and how devouring I can be if I'm comparing myself to you or you to me? You know how what I can begin to think about you? Or that you can begin to think about me? If, if I'm not living to, to your standard or you're not living to my standard? Understand that in Jesus, no one is better than anybody else. I'm not more worthy of it than you, and you're not more worthy of it than me. And Paul is saying in Galatians 3, where he says in verse 25, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's not, the Jew didn't deserve it more than the Greek. A, a, a male doesn't deserve it more than a female. He said, a slave doesn't deserve it any less than what a free person does. This is for everybody. And so this idea of comparison, which I think was absolutely going on here, is not good. It's not good at all. No one is superior. No one is better than anybody else. Maybe this week you're going to do more in the kingdom than I'm able to do. And that's good. I hope you do. Maybe I'm able to do more in the kingdom this week than what you're able to do. That's fine. But it doesn't mean I'm better or you're worse. Or you're better and I'm worse. It means work got done in the kingdom in the name of Jesus, which we ought to praise God for. Instead of looking at each other and going, shame on so-and-so. Wish he was doing what I was doing. Wish he was doing as much as, as I am. Maybe he is and you just don't see it. Maybe he's doing far more than you, than you are in the office and people are coming to Jesus and you don't know it and, and, and you're, you know, sitting here thinking you're better than they are. There's no freedom to be found in comparison. Working your way to be right with God and in comparison to Christianity are, are the two reasons there are a lot of Christians who have no joy in their life because they live in fear of asking themselves, have I done enough? And the answer to that question will always be no. You haven't done enough. You can't do enough. That's not a reason to give up. That's a reason to strive. Uh, it's a reason to, to continue to work in the name of, of Jesus for the kingdom. And so Jesus has set us free from this idea or this question, have I done enough? Well, okay, now it's, now it's what about obedience? That's a, that's a good question, one that needs to be addressed. <clears throat> We're told uh, in, in Hebrews 5 and, and verse 9, that in being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Does obedience play a part in this? Absolutely. You can't get around it. There's no way you can do enough thinking or maneuvering or looking for whole loopholes that, that you can say or exclude the concept or the idea of obedience. We, we live in obedience not to trust in our obedience, not that we're working to be accepted but we live in obedience because we trust jesus completely i do what he says because i've surrendered myself to him i've given my life to him to use however he sees fit whatever he wants and calls me to do and i do that because i completely and totally trust him when i start working for myself that's when i go I, I think I can do this better. I'm trusting myself. I trust what I think more than what Jesus has already done. Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Paul obeyed not to be right. Paul obeyed because he was made right. He obeyed because he trusted in Jesus. He obeyed out of love 
gratitude and appreciation. He didn't obey to be approved. He obeyed because he wanted Jesus to be seen in him. Obedience is evidence of trust. Obedience is your faith manifested for the world to see that you believe in, that you really believe in who you say you believe in. That it's not just a a profession, it's a way of life for you. That's what obedience is. Our motivation for living as Jesus is based on love and gratitude for the freedom he provides, not fear of what will happen if I don't do enough. The power to live as Christ, it's not self-generated, it's spirit-generated. That's why he says, uh, did, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Look at chapter 5 and verse 16. That's what we've been talking about the last couple of Wednesday nights. But I say, walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If I walk by the Spirit, if I'm so in tune with the Spirit, and that I've, I've completely and wholly given myself over to God, I'm not going to gratify the desires of the flesh, because I'm going to live in obedience not counting on myself but because i love god true freedom gives us the opportunity to show our love for god by serving one another this idea of doing good for the whole law is fulfilled in one word you shall love your neighbor as yourself you know someone uh, do you think you can write out a checklist that encompasses everything about new testament christianity That by the end of the day that you wouldn't have left anything out or anything undone? I don't think so. Matter of fact, I think it's absolutely impossible to do. There's a million and one different ways to love people and to bring the lost to Christ. That's why Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such there is no law. There's no checklist on how to fulfill those. There's no checklist and a way to to do those. My love for my neighbor is probably going to look different than the way that you love your neighbor. The way that you are a good Samaritan this week is going to look different than the way somebody else is a good Samaritan this week. The way that you show Jesus to someone else is going to be different than the way someone else shows Jesus this week. There may be a couple ways they coincide. They're going to have the same spirit behind them, the same love behind it, but it's going to be manifested in different actions. So, let's not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Galatians 5 and verse 26. True freedom. True freedom allows me to love and serve my neighbor as much as I want, in whatever way I can, without fear of what others will think, without fear of what others will do, without fear of wondering, have I done enough? Because I know that in Jesus I have a Father who knows who I am, His adopted Son. And in spite of the fact I can't do enough, He accepts me in Jesus, His Son. Because that's where my faith is. So Paul begins to close the letter to the Galatians. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those of the household of faith. And let's do it without a checklist. Let's do it without comparing myself to someone else. Do you want to experience true freedom in Christ? Trusting Jesus completely. And relating to God on the basis of grace and what Jesus has done is the way to do it. Allow your motivation to obey to be based not on your ability, but on your love and your trust and your submission to Jesus and the thankfulness that you have for Him. Jesus has set us free from the fear of have I done enough because He is more than enough. That's freeing. That is all inspiring. 
Matter of fact, that it ought to produce in us the spirit of worship. And so that as we wake up in the morning free, that we praise God and we love Him and we serve Him. And we do that by loving and serving others. True freedom, understand this, it isn't about being sinless. It's about living in gratitude and appreciation and without fear in Jesus. That's the goal. So Paul told the Galatians, I am again in anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. That's the goal. That ought to be your personal goal. That the world is witnessing Christ being formed in you. So I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you're struggling with. Maybe it's comparing yourself to others. Maybe it's a checklist. Maybe it's just fear and what life would look like if I really gave myself to Jesus and let His Spirit direct my life. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're in the position this morning through some daily study and prayer or with somebody else that you realize, I'm not a child of God and I'm lost. But I want to accept the free gift of grace that God has has purchased and given and is extending to me in Jesus. And you can receive that gift. The repentance, being immersed into Jesus so those sins can be washed away by His blood and being raised to walk a life immersed in Jesus, loving Him and serving Him and loving others and serving others without fear. Whatever your need is this morning, we encourage you to come forward while we stand and while we sing. We trust that our worship service this morning has been acceptable to God and uplifting to everyone here. We certainly want to uh, join Kenneth and Sean in welcoming everyone, especially our visitors. If you are a visitor, you're indeed our honored guest today. And uh, we certainly would uh, like for you to continue to come here, if at all possible. And any time you can be here, uh, we hope that you will. On our hospital list and prayer list today, uh, Bill Dye has uh, returned to his home at Richland Place Senior Living. That's good news. Our love and sympathy go out to the family of Jean Palmer Stinson, member here several years ago, passed away on Friday. Visitation will be here at the church building this coming Saturday, February the 6th, from 11 until 1 p.m. A funeral service will follow. It is uncertain at this time. Uh, whether that service will be here in the building or at the graveside, uh, and the, the family says no food will be needed. Those are our prayer lists, Charles Goad, John Collins, 
Wayne Gentry, Brother Barbara Venata, Ed Henson, Brooke Rowe, Buddy and Mary Ragsdale, Mildred Rogers, Mother Tish Mundy, Lily Malone, the friend of Kevin Law, and uh, we're adding one today, Bryce Thompson, who is uh, uh, deploying today. He's in the Air Force. He deployed this morning. He has a wife and a one-year-old child. So, and I think he is associated with the Estes family. So uh, please keep him in your prayers as well. For others who need our thoughts, our calls, our cards, our prayers, please refer to your bulletin or you can call the information line or check the website for updates on all these folks. We do have some cards that we need to read this morning. I can ex not express how much I appreciate the many acts of kindness and compassion from my church family this past week with the passing of my mother, Frances Dickens. Many thoughts, uh, many thanks rather for the food, the flowers, the cards, and the visits at the funeral home. A special thanks uh, goes out to Sean for his many comforting words he spoke at the graveside service. And that's from Patsy Hinton and family of Francis Dickens. And this card to my church family, thanks to all of you for the many, many acts of kindness and love shown to my Jane Ellen during her fight to overcome this terrible thing happening to her brain. She loved all of you. Thanks for all the cards and calls and prayers during my illness and the death of my Jane Ellen. I love you all, Martha Keith. In this card, dear church family, we want to thank you all so much for showering us with gifts and love as we awaited our sweet Asher. And for the gift cards and the meal train uh, once he, he arrived, we cannot express how blessed we are to be able to raise him in such a loving congregation. We hope you are all doing well and are longing for the time when we can get back to worshiping and fellowshipping with you all in person. In Christian love, Wade, Laura, and Asher Swearingen. In other announcements this morning, uh, Let's Talk will be held immediately after the service. Mike Reddick and Chuck Thornton will be available to you in room eight. There will be an elders deacons meeting this afternoon from 3 until 4.30 in the fellowship hall. And deacons be prepared to discuss uh, each committee's progress at this point. And we'll have other things to discuss as well. And if you have any questions or comments, please have those ready for us as well. Men's Bible study tomorrow morning, 6.15 a.m., Exodus chapter 28. Ladies' Wednesday Bible class will continue this Wednesday at 9.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Red Cross Blood Drive will be this Wednesday, February the 3rd, from 1 until 6 in the Fellowship Hall. Feeding Our Children will continue uh, next Sunday. We'll pack food bags at 4.15 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. The Senior Saints have, normally in February have a Valentine's banquet. It's been a staple here for many years. Uh, and this year we're going to have to change it a little bit uh, due to the uh, COVID. This is coming on, on Thursday, February the 11th. Uh, that is a week from this coming Thursday. It will be a drive-in pickup meal arrangement. The meals will be available for curbside pickup at the Fellowship Hall from 3 until 5 p.m. on February the 11th. If you're not able to pick up your meals at that time, we'll gladly deliver them to you. Please call Zella at the church office or Kenneth Wilbur on his cell phone to reserve your meals. The deadline to order your meals will be next Sunday, February 7th. Let us know if you plan to pick up your meal or if you need delivery at your home. And uh, these meals will be prepared by Carolyn Berry. Financial statements for the fourth quarter of 2020 as well as the yearly statement for 2020 are available on the tables in the foyer and the tables under the mailboxes in the educational hallway. Uh, this important announcement, uh, there has been a lost credit card and insurance card from the new van. They belong uh, to the van, and if you, have, you happen to have these, you accidentally stuck them in your pocket or you know where they are, 
uh, please return them to Bobby Gresham. Or you can see one of the elders. Our young men will conduct our worship services this evening and we encourage everyone to be here tonight for that, to, in, to uh, support and encourage our young people. Devotional books are still available at the doors of the auditorium. Remember to pick up your book and mark out your name off the list as it is provided. Uh, speaking of our dismissal policy, out of abundance of caution, I respectfully request that we dismiss by row today, but I'm not going to stand up here and direct traffic. Uh, when the previous row in front of you clears the door, then it's... Uh, Time for the next row to go. We'll depend on your good judgment on that. Remember to drop off your contribution on the way out if you have not already done so today. And also check your mailboxes as they are getting rather full. Are there any other announcements we need to make at this time? If not, let's be standing for our closing song in prayer. Pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that for the Lord this Lord's Day and that we could come out today to worship you and we pray that we would always be thankful for